entitled Innovations in Network and, Con and Connectivity, Discovering the Next Generation of Fastest and Most Efficient Trading Routes. I'm going to introduce the moderator, Ram Aluwalia, and then leave it to him to um, uh, go through and introduce or let the uh, panel members uh, introduce themselves. Ram uh, Aluwalia is a principal at Wingfoot Capital, a quantitative equity hedge fund that applies a systematic, multidisciplinary approach to generating alpha. Ram was a senior vice president at Bank of America Merrill Lynch and a member of the Cards and Deposits executive management team responsible for investment decisioning a $120 billion credit portfolio. Prior to this role, prior to this role, Ram was a was responsible for business development in the Merrill Lynch Global Bank Group, where he developed strategic partnerships in the airline, hotel, and retail segments. As a management consultant at Inductus, Ram advised Fortune 50 financial services firms in best-in-class decision-making frameworks for acquisition and risk modeling. <coughs> at the Cato Institute, Ram performed threat matrix and operating cost structure analysis for the defense and national security policy team. Ram received a BA in economics and philosophy from Columbia College. Ladies and gentlemen, Ram Alawalia and his pen. I'd like to welcome up our panel on the stage, please. Just have a seat. Thanks for the introduction, by the way. I think my mom wrote that. That was terrific. Well, we're going to have fun today. I had a panel prep discussion last Friday, and I walked away saying to myself that I could ask these guys about the nutritional differences between broccoli and, and Brussels sprouts, and I'm sure it'd be very engaging and intellectually stimulating. So it's going to be a fun panel. What, I'm, what I'd like to do now is ask each of the panelists uh, down the line to briefly introduce themselves, talk about their role, their background. My name is Chuck Diltz. I'm with Dell. I've been with Dell for about a year working on developing solutions for banking and securities vertical. I uh, spent my entire career pretty much working on Wall Street firms, starting with Solomon Brothers in the mid-80s, Deutsche Bank, and uh, a few other firms building low latency, most recently building low latency trading networks for um, several of the larger firms. Uh, my name is Marty Snyder. I'm with Communication Infrastructure Corporation. We're a microwave integration firm. Uh, we've been building microwave networks since 1995. Uh, since 2003, we've developed more than 30,000 microwave links uh, around the world. Uh, we've got, been involved in high frequency or ultra high frequency trading networks uh, using microwave for a couple of years now. I'm uh, Peter Novick. Uh, my entire career in the industry has been at Alston Trading. Uh, been there eight and a half years. Uh, I've run the gamut from uh, back office development to real time operational support to helping put food out on the lunch line and being the chief compliance officer. Um, but most of my career has been in the technology side and uh, I've recently moved into the business, uh, the business side, kind of the corporate strategy side of that because uh, uh, most of our business is applying technology to generating alpha. I'm Scott Nichols with Rotella Capital. Uh, we are a systematic global macro firm uh, in the managed future space. We also trade FX and equities. Um, in addition to that, we have a proprietary trading operation. Uh, we also have a family office and the majority of our trading centers around finding patterns and data and exploiting them. So we cover the gamut from timeframes all the way from micros up to multi-day strategies. I've uh, been with the firm since 2004. Before that, I was an independent trader at the CME. My name is Mike Persico from uh, Nova Technologies. Uh, our history dates back to building the first Eurex network here in the United States to some of the first trading arcades back in 99 to 2004. And today we've got a fiber metro footprint in Chicago, New York, and the UK. And we're o overlaying that footprint with RF connectivity. Terrific. So over the next 40 minutes, we're going to focus on this topic, innovations in network and connectivity, discovering the next generation of the fastest and most efficient trading routes. And as you can see, we've got a, a cross-section of the industry in the buy side as well as suppliers, so it's going to be an informative uh, discussion. Uh, I'll rattle off a couple of quick statistics here, I think, to set some context, and we'll dive right into some questions, and finally we'll open up for Q&A. So over the past you know, 10 years, we all know HFT has really transformed the industry. 
uh, volume turnover has quadrupled in 10 years. Uh, New York Stock Exchange listed securities have gone from having 80% of those securities traded on the NYSE in 05 prior to Reg NMS to about 24% today. And this, of course, reflects the proliferation of exchanges. Um, so it's a very dynamic, uh, shifty marketplace. Amidst, amidst all this growth, HFT players are competing. They're competing for smarter algos and lower latency. And to uh, start off, first question, I'd like to say amidst all this investment, Michael, if you could help us set the stage in terms of what are the different options to improve latency? What are the costs gained to the business and what improvement does that buy you? Well, you've got uh, investment uh, going on in, in a couple of different areas. You know, if you look at transatlantic, you've got uh, people seeking to get sub 60 milliseconds at you know an estimated cost of 450 million dollars. You've got people uh, who have built and potentially may build in the future Chicago to New Jersey. Uh, that's uh, generally about a 200 million dollar build, and then you've got you know uh, differing RF long haul builds that could be double digit million dollars and and be anywhere from eight to 10 milliseconds. And so, you know, you've got uh, a lot of investment going on in a space. And I think it, 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 we get to a point of what's the ROI for the firms and how close are we getting to zero? And, you know, those are the questions that, you know, everyone's asking from a service provider perspective as well as the trading firm perspective. Right, and Scott and Peter, you both provide that trading firm perspective. What's your perspective on the relative advantages and disadvantages of these different technologies, microwave, dark fiber, and so forth? Um, obviously, one of the advantages is when properly applied is speed. Um, but I think a lot of times people tend to lean towards speed at the cost of everything else, uh, where everything else is bandwidth. Uh, you know, microwave is great. Yeah, will it be three mics faster, four mics faster round trip? than having dark fiber, yeah. But, you know, you're not sending opera over your microwave link. Um, and then I think one of the big disadvantages is it seems easy, right? <laughs> it's a check. I want to get really fast. I just write a check. I'll get the faster line. That seems real easy. The problem is, is if you and 15 people are doing the same thing and uh, you're all shaving three milliseconds off, that three milliseconds is a wash. You're on a level playing field again. Uh, and when it's level, now you've got to start, now you've got to be concerned about the difficult stuff again. And you've got to look and say, well, okay, are my developers really top notch if I'm making use of every, if every, besides long haul, if everyone drilled down where they're going to find their latencies and their software. So if everybody goes with a relatively same long haul path, their latency becomes software. So um, I think one of the big disadvantages is it lulls you into thinking that shaving time is easy. Uh, this is not a, it's not an absolute number game. It, it's a waste of money to be the absolute fastest by a lot. It's a good use of money to be the absolute fastest by just a little. Um, but even that is probably more than you want to spend because you can make a decent amount of money by being 30th. Um, and so I think it lulls people into kind of a false sense of security. If I just invest in this, I'll be the best. And that's not always the case. Yeah, I mean, I'll probably echo a lot of what Peter said, it just in terms of we've discovered that getting faster and faster and faster, it's certainly something you can throw money at the problem. We, beyond a shadow of a doubt, you can throw money at the problem. We sort of, which isn't a good answer in any way, but we've sort of leaned towards the reliability side, and it's now with, I need it up all the time. I don't necessarily need the fastest. I think you could probably posit that everyone's, depending on your perspective on your back end stuff, everyone's about the same speed. So is it backing towards better ideas and not necessarily getting there faster? Uh, we finally, in the last couple of years, have been able to quantify additional speed, which I think a lot of people don't do. A lot of people's like, just push me, I wanna be faster than name your usual suspects and then my strategy will be okay. But we've taken a step back and be like, well, that's gonna cost 5X to get there. Let's quantify through you know, em empirical studies. Well, you know, in, in these given places, if you were X mics or you know Y milliseconds faster or slower, there's a demonstrable impact on PNL, and we haven't seen a demonstrable impact on PNL. And it's certainly the curve really decreases as you get faster and faster and faster because it's not just it's not just the sunk cost. It's constant. It's constant upkeep, and then every uh, you could say 12 to 14 to 16 months, you got to do it all over again. And there's something better. So there is certainly 
value in being that arms race if you have the capital and you have the ideas, but we've sort of said, well, if I have this amount of budget, I'll throw 90% behind idea generation as opposed to additional speed. Right, and Marty, you're our, our microwave specialist, so are you gonna take that comment about opera lying down? Or? <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I'm not a, a, a trader and, and being a technologist mostly, um, I can speak to some of the uh, advantages of microwave that I, as I know it, um, but certainly I, I, I can't uh, argue with the individual who uses these networks every day in the line of their work. However, we have built a lot of uh, mileage of network, microwave network for people who do care about it and the, um, the results they're getting are uh, they're extolling uh, and very pleased with, uh, so much so that they're investing more capital in microwave. And um, the differences are fairly dramatic in the speeds. You know, we're talking about 33% faster in microwave. Now, that may not make a big difference between, say, CIRMAC and Aurora, but it might make a very big difference between, say, Aurora and New Jersey, and even more of a dramatic difference if you're trading, say, between uh, Aurora and Frankfurt, Germany. The, um, the cost of building microwave is um, magnitudes less than building fiber, uh, although there's a lot of fiber that's already constructed and available, I'm sure, at reasonable prices. Uh, but one other component about microwave that I find very interesting is, in, in the, in the, uh, and that is no two networks are, are the same. So if you work at it, you can actually get a better microwave network if speed is important. It, it just requires time and energy uh, at a fairly uh, insignificant incremental cost. And, um, uh, and then the, the second point about microwave is it's actually finite um, because frequencies uh, are limited. It's a limited resource similar to real estate, whereas fiber optics is somewhat unlimited. Uh, frequencies are limited. True, it is bandwidth constrained, but um, it means that only a few people will have it ultimately in the end. Got it. Is anyone able to, to quantify the extent to which the bandwidth is constrained through your studies? Or No, but that would be a really interesting... Uh, That's for the next time. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what I would say to that, Ram, is that you know the spectrums that microwave lives in are not the only spectrums that you can use. Fair point. You know, there's 70, there's 80, there's 90, those are the millimeter wave spectrums. And uh, now they have a lower availability in terms of brain attenuation, but if those problems are solved for, then there's a whole, um, the cap on av availability and spectrum is removed. And right, there's, yeah. uh, people can then participate that might have otherwise been shut out right. from a microwave spectrum, spectrum perspective. So we're not at the end here we're at the beginning and, and there's more money than ever being put into these technologies. These technologies stayed static for 50 years. Right. And it's only been in the last two to three that people have been looking at reducing the latency, reducing the drag, and, and customizing them for what everyone in this room wants, which is increased payload and lower latency. Right, yeah, fair point. So, you know, the costs are high. So how do trading firms evaluate this from a, a build versus buy decision? Do you insource or do you look for external partners to, to help you develop your bridges as well as software? Peter Scott, how do you want to take it? I'll, I'll jump in on that one. Um, you know, we've always been in the build, and I, again, I'm speaking more from the software and all of the stuff in-house, obviously. Hardware and networking where we can, we're gonna outsource that, but in terms of our internal technology, we've been build end to end from the very beginning. Um, it's a, I think it's a question of control and customability. You know, we've we've looked at vendor solutions, and every time the the cost was maybe attractive, but all the custom work involving that, and more importantly, I'm not going to have someone at my beck and call on the vendor side as much as they may claim that in the cell initial cell call. Like, oh, you'll have 24, six level one, level two support. It's just not there. Whereas, you know. With the build route, I own it, so it can be custom, fast, and then we can watch it. It's kind of the route we go. Right. Now, that means you usually give up a little bit of stability, but again, you can throw people at the problem. So the only downside, and we discussed this when we had our initial call, is that people become your Achilles heel, and people will become our Achilles heel. If you get quality people, you're dependent on, you have one guy risk. 
Right. Uh, right. If you're lucky, you have two guy risk, and so that's that's the only problem with the build side is that in theory, if you buy a commercially available product, well, they're diversifying that. If one guy leaves, I'm not dead in the water, and I can still get custom work done. But I think that the flexibility on the build side, we've just always gone that route, and it allows us to be agnostic and also. If we build, I can then evaluate off-the-shelf products accurately. I can say, well, this is how fast I am. This is how much you charge. I know what my soft costs are. I'll pass or I'll take it. So we can evaluate things accurately, which is a little difficult to evaluate vendor to vendor. Got it. Great. Peter, how do you evaluate the buy, build by decision? Um, with lines, like all, all build by decisions to me are fundamentally the same. It really comes down to having, uh, and I don't think enough companies do this, fully assess what your alpha is. And, and then leverage whatever you build, and then build or buy appropriately based on your alpha. I mean, if, if speed is your alpha, God bless you. You're not long for the world, but God bless you. Um, and, uh, and go ahead and build and buy the best thing you can possibly get because you're just doing whatever you can. This is, I mean, we're at a point in our, in our industry, right, where if, if speed is your only source of revenue, you're treading water. You're spending as much money as you possibly can to maintain that edge. Uh, and you're getting incredible margin compression. Um, but if your alpha is not fully speed-based, if, if you're doing things in a sustainable way, where if uh, speed aids your alpha, it isn't your alpha, if, you're, if your smarts are making you dollars and your speed is squeezing every last penny out of it, you're in a much better situation to analyze if you want to do build versus buy and how much you want to spend in both cases. Uh, and then what it comes down to for me is not speed edge at that point with build versus buy, but flexibility edge. Um, do I want the flexibility to make my own changes whenever I need to make them? Um, now, I've had this more on the software side than the hardware side. Oh, well, I've had this more on software and hardware than I've ever had on any sort of line providing side. Mm -hmm. But you always run the risk uh, uh, with, when you buy it, you always run the risk of having to convince someone there's a problem. Uh, and having to convince someone there's a problem, for some reason, the burden of doubt is always put on the person who's paying the money never been able to figure that out. But uh, for some reason, the person paying almost always has to convince people that there's a problem. Uh, I mean, you do this in every aspect of life, not just in technology. I mean, you've got to convince your airline your luggage is lost. How do you do that? You don't have your suitcase. But it's a long argument, like every time, right? right? Um, so uh, it depends on if you want to have to spend that time or run that risk. If you can run that risk and there's a great cost trade-off on that risk, do it. Buy it. If you can't run that risk, if you need incredible flexibility, if you need a throat to choke and that throat needs to be sitting four feet away from you, you need to build it. And that's kind of how I analyze it. I think I'm about five feet, feet away. So yeah, you're fine. Is, uh, you're fine. Everybody else. My job's pretty easy. Well, and, and if I could play moderator here for one second, you know, how much of this is keeping up with the Joneses? You know, is there a point where it doesn't, you don't need to be fastest, but you're disadvantaged by not being as fast as the rest of your market participants? And so if we're all trying to achieve, achieve the race to zero, do you at least have to keep pace? Or is there an instance where it's acceptable to fall behind? Sure. And, and Chuck, what are your thoughts around that? Where are we in, in the race to zero? Well, first of all, I think you have to quantify where you are. You have to be able to measure where you are. So you have to be able to measure, for example, your uh, tick to trade. Um, how is that behaving under, under load? Um, is there any low-hanging fruit there that you can go after to improve that? Is it worthwhile, as been, has been mentioned uh, by various members of the panel, is it worthwhile to go after that and, and, adjust, and adjust, uh, go after that, uh, uh, those bottlenecks and eliminate them to increase your latency? But it comes down to uh, at least being able to quantify and measure your latency uh, before you can say you're going to zero. Uh, if your if you're, you know, fill rates are good, then you know, you, you sh it should be okay. Again, if you're running a strategy where the, the, uh, I agree 110%, if your strategy is strictly based on, on speed, then you better be looking at the, you know, having every vendor come through and, uh, you know, pinging them to find out if they have something that's going to make your life a little bit better. Uh, but there's, you, right now, it's you know, basic blocking and tackling to uh, quantify your latency, identify your bottlenecks, and do an evaluation if it makes sense to go after those. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Any thoughts on, on how we define the race to zero? How do we define latency? I, I think the race to zero is done, which is sometimes a controversial thing to say, but we're at zero, if not below it. And I don't mean like violating the laws of physics, but it's a race, it's a relative race. I don't have to be faster than the bear, I've gotta be faster than the rest of these guys if we're all running away from the bear. 
Um, so it's a, it's a relative race, and, and in this case, the bear, to a certain extent, is the exchanges. Um, if, the, if the variability of an exchange response time is two milliseconds, and you improve your matching, in, you improve your own internal system for trading by five mics, random variability at the exchange is gonna erase that five mic effort you just made, because the variability is two milliseconds. Um, if an exchange is at five mics and, and, you know, and you just shaved off 10 mics of your system, great. You're, you know, you've probably seen, uh, so it depends on the asset class, it depends on your strategies, but, but really, I mean, like take most futures exchanges, we are below the race to zero. How does, what do you mean by that? So there's a negative latency. That means the trade got done before I placed the trade or? No, no, I mean, uh, um, uh, it, I mean, take the standard deviation of an exchange time and make that zero. Got so it. if the standard variability within an exchange is a millisecond, you have a millisecond offset on your times already. Right. So if round trip to your own system is less than a millisecond, like you're already so much faster than to the, in the exchange, then you really have to start questioning, is it worth any more investment right. of time? That's the benchmark, that's a good way to look at it. Right. Yeah. So from a systems perspective, what kind of innovations can firms take on to, to improve their latency? Chuck, you wanna comment on that? Uh, well, if you do need to go out and improve your latency, obviously, as I referred to before, you have to identify where the latency is uh, before you can go out after it. Um, you know, again, you could look at lower latency switches. I mean, a lot of basic things too. I mean, I've walked into firms and they've opened up the cabinets in the back and they have cables spun up in the case. It's like, what are you doing? You know, you're paying for this expensive real estate and they have uh, five nanoseconds a meter and they had a 50 meter cable and they needed to get a server up. So basic things that you can do to, to um, uh, walk through the schematic of your environment and try to identify where that latency is. And again, it's pretty basic blocking and tackling. I mean, it's more straightforward for some things like HFT. If you do more of an algo with more complex systems involved, it becomes a little bit more difficult to dissect where your, your, your issues are. Um, but you know, from a systems perspective, what can firms do is uh, identify what systems are their, their, their bottlenecks and, and go after those. Right, and sometimes the game isn't all about improving latency, it's really trading effectiveness, to your point, and there are different methods to go about doing that. Uh, Marty, any thoughts around what innovations you can take to improve trading effectiveness or latency? Well, in the microwave arena, there's been some pretty substantial improvements uh, recently in uh, radio product, uh, even in some techniques in how to design networks and what types of products to use. Uh, for example, we can um, we have somewhere between you know five and eight microseconds uh, antenna to antenna in a repeater site, um, and with some uh, new developments and uh, actually with some old technology, some new application of some old technology, we're able to put within a chain of sites, say in a series of sites, maybe twenty or thirty sites, we can actually put in uh, a certain type of uh, repeater mechanism that takes that um, that site uh, equipment drag, you know, down from the five to eight microseconds down to say 100 nanoseconds. So uh, there's some interesting developments coming out in the in in our arena, you know, in the microwave arena. Terrific. So from the uh, trading firm perspective, do you still see latency as a key driver of profitability, or what are the other factors that you're looking at? What are the other tools or investments that trading firms should make to remain competitive? Um, you know, I think that because in our, our firm's example, we started, you know, a, in the history of our trading strategies, we had, you know, very, very traditional CTA model with, you know, 25 to 35 day holding period. And the progression to being latency sensitive there was on the execution algorithms. It's like, well, we want to execute these signals. We want to be smart about how we're going to access liquidity. And again, speaking only in the managed future space, too, I can't speak to equities on that. You know, th then it's like, well, I start to quantify that, well, perhaps, and this is years ago, you know, if I'm 500 milliseconds faster, maybe I'm getting somewhere, and maybe this, and so that, so then you start to, a serious investment, and we invest in co-location facilities, and we sort of update in like 2004, 2005, and then we're there, <coughs> and then we're faster, and going that extra mile, we've done it for some of our internal proprietary strategies. Mm -hmm. um, I personally have a very dim view of further investment in that space, not to knock any people who sell those sort of things. Um, but again, echoing what Peter was saying, the race to zero, we maybe got there two years ago in the future space. Um, the variability on the exchange side, the variability 
you have clock drift. You have you know people who are preaching the the grail of FPGA a couple of years ago. You know, again, every, anybody who puts serious work to it, you can beat it with software any day. And so all this money is being thrown at this, and I think it's obviously being pushed in angles like you need this, you need this, you need this, because I can't tell you who my other clients are, but they have it. And uh, you know, I think that a lot of those things, going back to like the building and buying, it's like I buy a lot of the stuff if you let me go month to month for like five months. Because it's like how how viable are some of these strategies that are very, very latency sensitive? You know, I, again, neither one of us will comment on that, how, how long good stuff lasts, neither anyone will, but I'll tell you this much, I'd hate to make a 24 month commitment on, you know, seven, $800,000 piece of technology thinking I'm gonna make money on it. Yeah. And that's really what, what a lot of this has become as well. I'm gonna keep reaching down the road a half million dollars at a time, hoping that the next great trading idea will come along to take advantage of this. And then maybe you get another group inside and they're like, well, I don't want that at all. I'm one millisecond sensitive. So chasing it down to zero, as I was saying, from our perspective, we've come more on the idea generation side is that we've seen more alpha throwing at money and resources at people and developing a breadth of trading ideas as opposed to, especially in the future space, going into crowded trades. Right. Is the way we look at it. Right. But, you know, if I could comment for a second on the race to zero, while I agree with the trading firm participants here that let's talk about intra-region, so the New Jersey region, it may not be applicable, but inter-region, we see another five to ten years of investment and latency reduction uh, that will make a substantive difference in people's arbitrage and their trades. So while I may not be talking about NASDAQ to NYSE, what I am talking about is NYSE to life. I'm talking about life to uh, Frankfurt. I'm talking about uh, Hong Kong. And those bigger inter-region plays will be where the investment is made and ultimately the race to zero continues. But intra-region, yes, you're, you're subservient to the exchange matching engines and you might not get the bang for your buck. But it'll be longer paths and it'll be uh, across longer distances. Yeah, yeah I think back to you know, kind of to bring it back to the question of, of is it a fundamental driver of yeah. profitability? Uh, I think you have a number of firms out there um, where it is the fundamental reason for their current profitability, but it isn't going to be the fundamental reason for their continued profitability. It'll be there and it'll help and there's good money to be made. Um, but like I was saying earlier, it's uh, I, what's happening, I think it, it, you gotta step back and almost look at a whole industry. There's quantitative hedge funds out there that are very, very smart and they know their stuff and they're getting faster and faster every day. And what's the great thing about this for them is they can buy speed. Yeah. You can't buy quantitative analysis. You can't buy great trading strategy. You can buy people that might develop them for you, but there's a high degree of risk there. Um, it's not like an overnight thing. Like if I had write a big enough check, can I be twice as fast within three months? Yes. Can I be twice as smart within three months? Hell no. It takes a lot of work and time and effort. And there's no silver bullet there. Um, so I think what you're starting to see is that because these, uh, those who are smart are getting faster, um, the people who are already fast are getting faster too, but they've also got to get smarter. Right. Otherwise, I mean, you're just not gonna compete. Right. So, um, so while I think it is a fundamental reason for a lot of current profitability, I don't see it as a fundamental driver for uh, continued profitability. Right. And, and on that point, do you see smaller HFT firms uh, able to survive with the required investments. Uh, I mean, what do you, I say this jokingly, but like in Chicago, it's like every explorer trader and their brother-in-law has started an HFT right. firm. So by smaller, do you mean like three people or 40 yeah, people? Smaller in terms or? of uh, scale of trading, revenues, organization size, however you want to define it. I think it depends on your requirements. It, all my answers depend on something, which is a real cheap way of not answering the question, I know. <laughs> but, but you have the uh, potato now, so yeah. I know that's no, but, uh, cool. I'd say, uh, um, I think there's a space for all those companies. Like there, there are people who, I, my apologies to anyone from PT, but it's just a good example because it's the only one I know if you're here. PT is painfully slow compared to what I've built internally. Yet, I you know, go to lunch at the Chinese restaurant underneath the Board of Trade and half the people in there are making money trading on TT. And they're doing yeah. kind of arbitrage yeah. strategies or spreading or, so there's money to be made by not being the fastest. It just kind of depends on what your ceiling is and what your overhead is and kind of where you're aiming for. And any other thoughts around that? Can, fall, can small firms enter or survive? I think that um, you're going to have to 
late, you're gonna have to define the term HFT then. That's the most poorly used term, just like ultra low latency or low latency. What Peter thinks a low latency, what I think a low latency, what you, we could ask everybody, we'll have a different perspective on that. So can a, a three person shop with a half million dollar a year budget for technology in general compete? Absolutely. What do they define as high frequency? If they're, if they're being, if they have inherently passive trading strategies that aren't really chasing very, very crowded trades and equity index futures, beyond a shadow of a doubt. Yeah. But to somebody, again, coming from, let's say, a, a, a clicking environment to that, somebody that has an automated algorithm built in an off, you know, something commercially vi viable where they're, you know, they're making, they maybe have 100 millisecond reactionary time, that's high frequency to them. Yeah. And that doesn't mean that a shop that's you know five ten mic sensitive on their their loops through their algorithms should laugh at that. There's places to everybody to make money, but can a small shop and I'm assuming that means they're capitalized at the level of small yeah, shop sure. play in um, book pressure in the U.S. equity exchanges? I would have to say emphatically no on that. Great. Any other comments? Okay. Well, uh, this last question from my perspective, we'll turn it over to the audience for Q and A. Perhaps a little off topic, but I'm really curious to hear your answers on this. Are there any lessons learned from uh, either the flash crash or some of the recent uh, you know, news around Facebook or the flopped bats IPO? And clearly, there's some exchange issues at work here. They're not broadly appreciated, I think, by the by the retail investing audience. But has any of these uh, you know phenomena impacted either how you trade or how you serve customers? I'll open that up to everyone. There comes a time in every panel where I just put my foot in it and never am able to retract myself, so this might be that time. <laughs> um, no, I don't think it fundamentally changed the way we trade uh, at all. Uh, uh, Alston and, and a lot of our, our uh, competitors are incredibly risk adverse. I mean, that's why we got into the low latency game to begin with. Uh, one, of our, one of our founding partners told me the reason he started looking at computers was because he was trading in one pit and then he would turn around and signal to his partner in another pit and that guy would, you know, would then get the hedge off. And in the time it took him to flash his hands up, accept the trade, and turn around, everybody's hands were down. And he was like, well, Jesus, I turned around in like two seconds, so what's faster? You know, and it wasn't because he really wanted to make a lot of profit, it's he wanted to avoid the loss on his strategy. Right. Um, so the idea of, uh, it's very risk adverse, that's what the low latency started as, being just very risk adverse. Um, so we were already pretty risk adverse. We already tested the hell out of everything. Um, you know, uh, we already expected tail events. We put a lot of time and money and effort into operational support. And by operational support, I don't mean like you know, installing Microsoft. I, I mean like knowing the intricate details of every matching engine. I still re like remember the silence I got on the other end of the phone when I think the name of the system was Ghost, and it was like the old system the CME used to look up orders. And I was like, look, no, just go to page two on Ghost and look at this. And the people were like, how the hell do you know this? <laughs> That's completely proprietary, you shouldn't know that. Um, but we put a lot of time and effort into just learning these things and paying attention and sharing notes and trying to figure this stuff out. And um, uh, so none of these events changed the way we trade. Um, what it did was it shined a spotlight on how incredibly complex the systems are. Right. Um, and so the only thing that's really changed for me is pushing even more with uh, regulators and competitors and other people in the space of We've got to stop trying to fix things, fix by making them more complex. Uh, there's only one guaranteed way to make a system more fragile, and it is to layer more complexity and more interaction on top of it. We really need to step back and start simplifying and simplify the whole system. Um, so, I mean, it really, so I guess short answer, it did not change the way we trade. It didn't change the way we view risk. It didn't uh, change the way we interact with the markets. It changed the way we interact with regulators. Um, and it maybe added one extra spin to it, which is, to me, maybe one of the most dangerous things for our markets, is we now have to interact with legislators. Right. Um, and I mean, like, I've gone into meetings with people who, as I'm walking in, it's like, why are the BCS committee walking out? And I'm now talking to a legislator about whether or not the markets are safe and risk, you know, and what systemic risk is. And he just had a conversation about whether or not the state of Oklahoma is going to be happy about the new BCS system. 
So, I mean, these are, this is now our interaction about making safe markets. So it's changed that. It really hasn't been a technology or risk thing for me. Fair point. Yeah, I mean, I, I would echo that sentiment. What it's what it's really done is it's continued to demonize HFT and has hasn't, you know, you would think that some of the events that have transpired, you know, they would sort of fade into into the background. But when you have, you have bats and you have Facebook, it, it it allows people to to continue to go after something that they that, that they they don't know what it is and they can't quantify, and 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 makes things uh, very difficult. So it's kept things in the news. And it's it's kept things salient, and that's uh, you know that's been a problem for the industry as a whole. But where I, and this is completely off topic, where where I think it's made a difference is on the retail side. You know, I I, I think the trading firms, as as Peter has alluded to, are are set up to ameliorate risk. But you know, uh, the people that trade the markets, you know, uh, as as individuals, the retail public, you know, they had to be shocked that Nasdaq had a problem. You know, and, and and that resonates, and and then I think that it, you know, the, the the Facebook IPO was supposed to prop up the whole IPO market, and there was a, a systemic failure there, and that has had a ripple effect for every IPO going forward, and for all the equity markets going forward, and so there's you know for maybe the people on the panel it hasn't made a difference, but I, I think it has in, in a bigger sense. Sure, uh, that's, that's the point. Is it yeah. It's, it's also decreased who we can flow, you know, interact with, which uh, is it's changing the risk profile of the market. We're a much safer market if there's a whole lot of diversity of flow and people interacting in the markets for a large variety of reasons. And it, it, it has been a decrease in confidence of the consumer and of retail investors, and that has added to the systemic risk of the marketplace. Yeah, that was a good point. Yeah, and no, I'd, I'd agree and echo those thoughts. You know, over the last five years since HFT, we've seen more narrow bid-ask spreads, there's more depth, there's more liquidity. And you're right, it does seem like HFT is the, is the whipping boy for any time something goes wrong at the exchange level. Uh, any other thoughts, Scott? Well, I'd say, you know, obviously after, uh, more specifically to the flash crash, we certainly got calls from investors just to say, you know, very simply, hey, was it bad for us today? And, you know, I will, I've been on my soapbox since that happened about the futures industry versus the equities industry, yeah, saying, you know, I studied the data, I studied the depth data for that entire day and everything that happened, and the futures industry and the futures markets handled it exactly how it should have been handled. And there was you know, loss protection, and, and there was protection in the engines, and especially the CME, that it, it happened exactly the way it was supposed to happen. Things like that are gonna happen. So what I'd say to those, especially in the Facebook IPO, it's like, it's like this is a newsflash that there's risk in the market. There's risk. Welcome to risk. Yeah. And so, as, you know, again, I'm, I have my futures industry hat on, but I'm like, this is why, this is why you have to be who you have to be to trade futures products, and why there's so much capital involved. We have to be so capitalized because there is significant risk. And so, what I say to the equities community is, I'm like, you wanted it this way. You wanted a fragmented market. You wanted this. This is this is what you asked for. Now you have it, and now you're complaining that someone's faster that they can get to both dark and lit environments faster, and that's why you lost money. Ultimately, you, you lost money because there's risk in the market. You know, there was technology failures, but, and I'm stealing Peter's idea too, we talked about before, is those of us have been trading futures long enough and been trading on varying exchange systems, it's like, it wasn't that long ago when, you know, Globex had issues every other day, or something went wrong, or you call up and you say, listen, you know, I got, it took 17 seconds of the confirmation on this order, yeah, we agree. You know, th these things happen. This is this is called risk. This is why you should be well capitalized to play in these markets. And so we get these, you know, obviously you can demonize HFT and whatever happened with the flash crash, whatever happened to these H IPOs. It's, you know, c again, for me coming the full gamut from being an ex-floor trader, it's the same thing. You know, I used to complain that, well, that guy stood closer to that broker. So there was your latency advantage because you're five inches taller than me or you're five feet closer, but I had no one to cry to. So now I think that, you know, in the legislative body, and especially Congress, they, they've, you know, here's a shoulder to cry on for constituents. And it really is, you know, but I think that in terms of the way we manage risk, we always have protection for every single position we've ever put on. And yeah, those instances weren't good for us, but that was well expected within the parameters of the market. Right. Yeah, it's an interesting point of view. I mean, hey, look, risk is a cost of doing business. That's why we're in this, we get compensated for taking certain risks. But I think there's another point around the integrity of capital markets and to the extent that we have expectations that our trades will settle and clear accurately and timely, 
we all benefit from that. And I think echoing a lot of the other points brought up here, there's a, I think the misplaced spotlight on the HFT firms versus, you know, the exchanges and the matching engines that seem to, uh, you know, put us in these occasional snafus. Uh, with that said, why don't we open up to some uh, audience Q&A. We've got a couple more minutes here. I think that's a powerful closing remark, apparently. Okay. <laughs> Marty, how many firms are up and running with microwave right now? How many will be up and running uh, December of this year? So how many HFT firms will be up and running at the end of this year? Well, probably by, uh, by the end of the year, you'll see uh, three times the amount that are there today. Um, all, all these amounts can be counted on digits on your human body. Very nice. Great. Any other comments, questions? Any other thoughts? All right. How's regulation affecting the race to zero? So. I think sane regulation won't. I think misplaced regulation will. Uh, I, I personally think minimum quote life is one of the worst options out there because it's, and, and I don't mean that just for my own personal, like, oh man, it costs my company money. I mean, that, like, I'm stepping back and taking like a good citizen of the world and markets view on this. Um, minimum quote life would be insane. And the reason I think it would be insane is we would basically be saying it is completely free to add risk to the market, but God forbid you try to remove risk from the market. Because that's what charging for cancellations and minimum quote life basically penalize you for trying to remove risk from the market. And that is nuts in a system where we're so concerned about systemic risk. Um, so I actually think regulation, proper regulation, like the way the SEC and CFTC used to do regulation where they would have an idea, they'd float it out there, people would respond, they'd, they'd have these open meetings, they'd respond again, they'd maybe do a trial program, they'd see how that worked, and we're talking like three to four years to make these changes. I don't think that's gonna impact the race to zero too much. I mean, besides the fact that three to four years takes forever, you know, in this world. But I do think legislation could have a negative impact. Um, uh, the other thing to remember, like legislation could force the regulators to do so. I actually heard a member of the CFTC say recently, the best thing that happened to the deadlines for Dodd-Frank is that we didn't hit them, because we didn't have to worry about them anymore and we could do our job. That's kind of scary. Um, but uh, I think anything like that, minimum quote life, uh, I think um, uh, the, uh, there's one idea that's being floated by somebody at NYU that a couple of regulators seem to really like of just changing the day from a continuous streaming central limit order book to like uh, auction every 10 milliseconds or something where it would just be continuous auctions throughout the day. None of those things stop the race to zero or, or take an emphasis away from latency. They just move the gate. Like now everybody's gonna be racing to wherever that gate is. Right, and so you can move it back again, everybody will race to that. So it doesn't, it just changes the end point. It doesn't change the overall kind of arms racy feel to it. So don't these ideas around, you know, charging for canceled orders, doesn't that prevent the uh, perception or the, or the notion of that there's liquidity, but as soon as the real money buyers step away, the cancels appear and the liquidity disappears. I think Blair Hall talked about that a little bit this morning. So uh, what are your thoughts around that? Are you saying that charging for canceled orders does not address the notion that many of the HFTs, as they're making markets, are riding along other existing bids and offers from, from real money institutional buyers? Uh, no, I, mean, I was even going a step simpler, just saying all it really is, by having a minimum quote life or paying to cancel, you're basically putting a cost on people managing their risk. Uh, when you put a cost on people managing your risk, you impact negatively the flow coming in and out of the markets. And I think a mm -hmm. less risky marketplace is one that has flow from a lot of content, a lot of different people for yeah. a lot of different reasons. Uh, and they're making money in a lot of different ways. And, and charging for risk removal, charging for canceling an order, or, and I know minimum quote life, it doesn't seem like charging, but it is because there's, the rest of the world is moving at real time. 
So there's a risk there and there's a charge for having your order yeah. out there. Yeah. Uh, when I say the rest of the world is moving in real time, it means that like, there's no like, okay, well, uh, let's say there's a minimum quote life in the equities market um, and uh, Steve Jobs is dead. Um, let's pick some other CEO dies. Are people supposed to sit on that news until the minimum quote life of everyone in the market is pulled? You need to be able to react in real time to real news and real signals. And what's minimum quote life? Let's say it's 10 millisecond minimum quote life. I'm making that up. I know it's being videotaped, so I hope no one with decision making hears 10 milliseconds. Because that'd be even worse. But um, so 10 milliseconds, and there's like 16 lit venues for Reg and MS. What are the chances that all those minimum quote lives are going to end at the exact same nanosecond, the exact same microsecond? People are like going to be racing between the things to pick people off. It's horrible. Um, do it in the futures market. Okay, we can do it in the futures market. There's vertical, you know, there's, there's vertical integration in the futures markets. There's no, uh, so it's not like another market can pick it off. Well, now if I have a minimum quote life on my gold future and the gold ETFs move dramatically, I see this data come, but I can't cancel my order and I've just got to cancel it just sitting there queued. Like, man, I know I should be canceling this order, but I can't. Right. You know, that, that doesn't work for right. the markets because now you've got people that are getting wiped out and they're not coming back tomorrow to play. Right. So, right. Yeah, excellent yeah. point. Well, we'll continue the debate over cocktails later. That said, uh, please uh, thank my panelists for their excellent contributions.